Hello and welcome to India's World. Today we are going to discuss the report of the US Senate Intelligence Committee which has indicted the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, for questionable retention and torture of terror suspects. The committee concluded that the use of torture by the CIA was ineffective either in gaining actionable intelligence to prevent future terrorist attacks or in arresting terrorists targeting the US, including Osama bin Laden. Some of the coercive techniques used by the CIA's interrogators had not been approved by the Department of Justice or even by the CIA headquarters. The Senate committee also found that those within the CIA ranks who objected to the torture and detention techniques were reprimanded and marginalized. To discuss this path-breaking report and its implications, we have with us a very distinguished panel of experts. We have with us Mr. A.S. Dullath. He's the former chief of India's external intelligence agency, the Research and Analysis Wing. He was also a special director in the Intelligence Bureau. He was Prime Minister Vajpayee's advisor on Kashmir and also a member of the National Security Council Advisory Board. Thank you very much for coming here today and joining this discussion. We have Ambassador Vivek Karju. He was India's ambassador to Afghanistan and Myanmar. He knows the AFPAC region very well and is familiar with the nursery of terrorism that exists in that region. And we have with us Mr. Rana Banerjee. He retired as special secretary in the research and analysis wing, the external intelligence agency of India. And he's an expert on security and intelligence issues. I welcome you gentlemen to this discussion. Mr. Dulat, let me begin with you. How should the world and India view the US Senate Intelligence Committee's sweeping indictment of the CIA program to detain and interrogate uh, terror, terror suspects in this questionable manner? I don't think it really impacts on us in the sense that we don't do anything like this. It's, it's for the Americans to decide. And uh, the American uh, people and the, their representatives. So if there has been an indictment, I think uh, some of the methods used, uh, methods of torture, have been quite unique. We've never heard of anything like this. Whether it's uh, waterboarding or, or uh, you know, keeping somebody awake for uh, five nights with loud music uh, blaring. Obviously, you can get him to say anything after that. Whether it's right or wrong is, is another matter. And now if, if the Senate committee has said that it was of no, no use, then I think it should be a bigger concern. More importantly, I think a lot of what has happened, or at least some of what has happened, like uh, rendition, has been violative of the Constitution. So I mean, it's for the Americans to decide, basically. We don't do it. And they lecture us, they pontificate on human rights and, and whatever. We'll, we'll discuss this, right. uh, this a bit uh, further later on. Uh, Vivek, uh, why do you think CIA officials routinely misled the Vice White House and the Congress about the information they obtained through torture and these uh, extreme techniques of interrogation as well as detention? Why do you think they avoided uh, basic uh, oversight of uh, the secret prisons or the black sites they operated all over the world? I think there are two reasons. One, uh, the United States is a very litigious society. So they are open to all kinds of legal action. And secondly, there are moral issues involved. So there they knew they were doing issues. something illegal and immoral? Well, I'm not quite sure on the legality of it because there were certain <laughs> findings at certain stages which allowed certain techniques. So perhaps they acted within the ambit of those techniques and later on those findings were overturned. But uh, uh, certainly... There's also the question of deniability. I think in, in bureaucracies, as well as in politics, you want to keep the top man, and the top man and the top leadership wants to keep away uh, from things that can be terribly embarrassing. Deliberately wants to keep away? Yes, of course. Knowingly? Yes, of course. Knowingly and deliberately. These are facts of life. This happens in all bureaucracies. It's not so they would to sanction the, the, the American bureaucracy. Of, they would sanction the setting of black sites on non-American soil because... These camps yes, were from yes. Thailand to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Central Europe or wherever else. So how did they allow, uh, how did all this happen without anybody knowing what was happening? No, no, I think, I, I, I think within the system people would have known. And I'm sure that there were rumors flying around. But then one also has to see the atmosphere which existed exactly. uh, in those years. Okay, let me take that question to, 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 uh, to Mr. Banerjee. So was torture used by the CIA largely because in the wake of 9-11 uh, attacks, the US government had very little information on what these organizations were, what their future plans were. And there was tremendous amount of doubt that, you know, maybe more such attacks were being planned and they had to be prevented. Yes, the pressures after 9-11 were immense. And uh, they 
were able to lay their hands on two main suspects who were close to Osama bin Laden a year or more than a year afterwards, namely Abu Zubaydah in 2002 and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in 2003. And, and these were the two main people who were subjected to these morally reprehensible, severe uh, you know, tactics of uh, waterboarding or even rectal rehydration and things like that. And uh, to begin with, they revealed a lot of things, but towards the end of their you know, treatment, they were uh, literally you know, uh, in a vegetable status almost. So it was, uh, you have to take a balanced view of it, what they got or what they didn't get. But I think in the beginning, they were under severe pressure. Okay. And they did get uh, several important leads. But, but the Senate uh, committee doesn't think so. They, th they, they have established that uh, whatever information they got was before torture began. That's a disputable view in my view. Because you see, interrogations are often very, very you know, uh, valuable leads. And for the intelligence professional, uh, how you assess an interrogation report is quite different from how an objective political analyst would look at it. So I think the, the differences of view are because of this reason. Okay. You wanted to say something? Yeah, I wanted to say this, that I, first of all, just to endorse what uh, Ambassador Kaju said, that I think we have to remember the mood in, in the United States at that time and the mood in the, among the leadership, uh, very gung-ho. I mean, Dick Cheney still calls this report crap, you know. He yeah. says, yeah, so, so, you know, that is the kind but, of mood it, it no, was done. No, I, I take, I take that point it. about the mood. As far as interrogation goes, uh, what uh, Rana is saying is, is very correct. That, you know, when everything else fails, then interrogation is, is very vital. It provides... Uh, but how, how now, for effective instance, is torture it, as, a, as a mode no, of we, interrogation? It's not effective. Let me put it like this. So you then know, how can I, you justify... I will tell you, I will tell you uh, in, in relation in, to... In circumstances I'll you tell you nothing. in relation to the Punjab and in Kashmir, the in Intelligence Bureau had some outstanding uh, interrogators, very skilled interrogators, and there was no question of torture, you know. Yeah, they, naturally, if a guy is with you, you're not having a love chat. It's not a very polite conversation. And he, he's always worried that, you know, when he might uh, get a slap or, or when he might get thrashed. But nothing like what, what we are hearing of uh, what the Americans have used. It but, was but, not necessary. But when, surely the interrogator would know that... And we that got some of the best intelligence through interrogations. No, no, in the case of America, I'm talking of just now, that... If you're not getting any actionable intelligence through these questionable uh, methods of uh, interrogation, then what does the whole process become? It, it becomes something else. It's no longer an interrogation I'm, to, I'm to trying, gather intelligence. I'm trying to tell you that we did get very, very good intelligence through without torture, yeah. both in relation to the Punjab and in Kashmir. Kashmir was a little trickier because the Kashmir is a little different, you know. He's, he, he's more crooked, more devious. So he would take you up the wrong path. But still, we got uh, very good intelligence. So torture doesn't, by itself, does not lead to actionable intelligence. I don't, good interrogation I don't believe techniques that. do. Absolutely. Okay. You want to say something on this? No, no. I thought the, his last comment was interesting. As a Kashmiri, as a, do you take, as, do you take well, objection? As a, as a Kashmiri from a person whose ancestry is Kashmiri, I, I don't think the Kashmiri is any more devious, etc., than any other human being. Maybe you've been straightened by Alaba than you. No, 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 no. <laughs> My genes are Kashmiri, so I know. Okay. okay, all right. We need to take a break at this point. We'll be back again with this interesting discussion in a bit. Don't go away. Welcome back. We are discussing the U.S. Senate Committee's report on CIA and condemning the techniques of torture and confinement that the CIA used against terror suspects. Mr. Dulat, uh, before we went on the break, you wanted to say something. No, no, I said uh, I should not be misunderstood. Uh, I must apologize to Ambassador <laughs> Ka Kaju. You know, I have had a very long association uh, with the Kashmiris and I love the Kashmiris. But, but they still mislead it, you. But they, <laughs> no, but they are devious. I mean, that's part of their character. Maybe that's the way so we thank made Thank you them. for telling me this because, you know, uh, Ambassador Kaju is always on our programs. So I'll have to be very careful of him. <laughs> Rana, let me ask you this. Is the sense of fear and panic that the security establishments the world over feel after a major ter ter uh, terror strike, are they justifications enough? for torture and uh, questionable detention. That may not be so, but these two particular persons whom I mentioned, they were proving to be very hard nuts to crack. And they were actually misleading a lot in the beginning. 
they were arrested in 2002 and 2003 as i said and they were sent to talking of uh, yeah, Zubeda abu zubaida and, and khalid sheikh mohammed and they went to guantanamo only around 2006 so in between the two three years they really didn't reveal much although the torture had already started in some other prisons uh, in portugal and also in bagram in afghanistan but then they started uh, revealing things confessions around 2006 and uh, khalid sheikh mohammed confessed to the murder of daniel daniel pearl for instance who was killed in february 2002 so that was the time when lot of information started coming yeah. uh, vivek what kind of dilemma does the indictment of the cia by the senate intelligence committee pose for president barack obama because you know to be fair to him within one week of his assuming power he put an end to this program but now after the senate report has come he has been forced to describe the cia officers involved in the program as patriots to whom the us owes a profound debt of gratitude while at the same time condemning uh, some of these techniques naturally his dilemma is that of any political leader faced with a situation where he has to ensure that uh, his premier investigative agency yeah. Yeah. Uh, on which uh, uh, the struggle against terrorism depends yeah. Uh, is not castigated as a whole or plain painted black at the same time he cannot uh, cannot condone what is reprehensible so in that situation he is walking a tight rope and uh, he is doing it as best as he can in uh, he is landed with this situation which is not of his creation which was of the creation of his predecessor uh, so i th- i think uh, all told one does, it's part of Amer- the american domestic process and one doesn't really have to pay much attention to well, to considering this terrorism is a, is has an international character i would beg to disagree no, with you there no no but I, i'm talking about obama is saying. obama's dilemma I'm, is it i'm not talking one? about but the, the, the issue dilemma. itself this would be the dilemma of any democratically elected leader if such techniques were discovered elsewhere Uh, and if they were prevalent in other democracies of course and there was oversight this is a dilemma of any democratically elected leader but, but let me yeah let me take the question of his predecessor to you president george w bush is on record saying that the detention and interrogation program of the cia was humane and that it was legal and that it had uh, the intelligence uh, gleaned from these interrogations had led to the arrest of uh, senior uh, capture of senior figures of al qaeda now the senate intelligence committee's report says all this is untrue they have taken 20 major cases from the uh, uh, cia files and found that torture played no role at all in disrupting uh, uh, terrorism plots or capturing terrorist leaders or even finding bin laden so what was bush saying and why was he saying it he was saying what he was being told now the the senate uh, intelligence report also says that bush didn't know the details for the first four years uh, or whatever it, it's it's a bit like you know whether nawaz sharif knew about kargil or not and how much what how many details did he did he know but um, I think you know uh, that the question really is now. Of course, uh, the CIA is claiming that uh, they have renounced those enhanced uh, techniques, and I'm sure they they would have under President Obama. Obama's dilemma is is quite straightforward. That after all, he is the leader of the nation, so to a certain extent, he has to defend much the same as the DCI has to defend his people. After all, you can't be a leader without that. but what they have done i mean and what has happened what is on record is inexcusable especially when you pontificate to the rest that, of the world yeah. I, i think that is the crucial point which is most embarrassing to the americans okay one more crucial point to my mind was uh, uh, the the intelligence agency that is cia in this case routinely misleading the government so i want to ask you as a former intelligence officer is it routine for intelligence agencies to give false information to the government so that the government is not do unduly upset does not interfere uh, in their activities uh, for example in one uh, simple instance the cia actually issued a internal email saying that keep the number of detainees low at 98 don't declare all of them don't stop counting after 98 so there were 26 other illegal detainees that means those people under the law should not have been detained at all so is it routinely done that you lie to the government no the short answer to your question is no but the uh, the chanakiniti is uh, you know that you build up intelligence and you don't report on every specific thing so you collate other bits of information also and you give a cumulative picture to the government authorities it is like saying ashwatthama hatha iti gaja 
So, you know, you tell only, the, you reveal that bit of the truth that is relevant for taking action. You don't reveal that bit of the truth which is If it is not also. necessary, you don't have to. But you don't deliberately mislead. That shouldn't be done. Listen, mm -hmm. uh, as a diplomat, whenever I received a report on my table, hmm, I scrutinized that report to see whether it matched with other inputs that were coming in. So therefore, whereas uh, the reports of the intelligence agencies are of great importance, yet uh, political leaders and, uh, and those uh, in the bureaucracy, like uh, in the foreign office, etc., who are dealing with those reports, have to have a degree of skepticism. But, uh, but Mr. Adulat, I think, uh, uh, you know, what you said about uh, 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 Mr. Uh, uh, Vivek Kartju and the Kashmiris may be right because he's <laughs> deliberately misunderstood my question. My question was not about whether <laughs> all intelligence is good or bad. My question was, do intelligence agencies lie about their techniques, the kind of, the number of people they have arrested, the way they are interrogating them to their governments? so that they're not, they don't fall foul of the law. The see, word deliberate was see, wrong in that see, context. The point is we don't have any parliamentary oversight and we don't go into techniques where, where government is concerned. I don't think government asks and we don't uh, reveal even operational details. We reveal, uh, you know, what is, uh, action, what is intelligence which is useful to the government. I think the more dangerous thing sometimes is to be telling the government what the government wants to hear. You know, I think it should not go to the other, other extreme as well. But uh, as far as oversight goes, I think gradually time will come. I, I think it's a little premature here yeah. uh, in our country, but it will Look, come and we, it should we, come. We will discuss it uh, in, in, in a moment, but we need to take a break at this point. We'll be back again in a short while. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing the U.S. Uh, uh, Senate Intelligence Committee's report on CIA and its questionable use of torture and detention techniques. Uh, Vivek, isn't it praiseworthy that the U.S. democracy has this kind of oversight of its intelligence agencies and has the courage at least to make part of the conclusions of that committee uh, public? It was 6,000 page report, some 500 odd pages and damning pages have actually been released in the public sphere and are up for debate. No, I think these matters should be debated in mature democracies. Uh, I also feel that India is now mature enough uh, to look at these issues in a cool and, and uh, reasonable and rational manner. Uh, the word praiseworthy is what uh, I find sticking out. Why? Well, the American system is a terribly contentious system. And there is a domestic... Uh, aspect to it. After all, this report is coming out before the, the change takes place in the American Congress with a weak control. So those aspects also have to be taken into account. Um, Mr. Banji, the U.S. Justice Department has rejected uh, the prosecution of CIA officers involved in uh, uh, these questionable interrogation techniques or this, the kind of detention they used on the ground that, and I quote, the admissible evidence would not be sufficient to obtain and sustain convictions beyond a reasonable doubt, unquote. However, there are others in America who claim that the Senate report gives sufficient evidence of crimes already committed and therefore identify those people who committed those crimes and give them harsh punishments. So my question to you really is, do you think some individuals may yet be punished or do you think rather than punishing individuals, there will be a change in the legal system and there will be change in the supervision and oversight of the CIA by the Congress. It's difficult to say. I am not totally aware of the constraints that prevail in the environs there. But if you would like to move to an Indian parallel, we have had a situation like this over the Gujarat cases. And I am a believer that, you know, uh, interrogating officials or officials who are doing their duty in public interest, they should have certain protection. Though again, I also believe that the time for accountability but has come. I don't come. want to go into Gujarat, but it's, it's okay. questionable whether the officer was acting in national interest or in the interest of uh, certain other political forces. Well, either way it's possible, but benefit of doubt should go to the okay. officers okay. who All are right. doing this type of work. That's a point of view, but let me ask you this, Mr. Dulak. You've been claiming that Indian intelligence agencies do not indulge in torture. I believe you. I have no reason to doubt you. Then how do they get innocent people 
to confess to terrorism uh, uh, crimes and it takes a long legal process then to get them released or somebody else comes and confesses and gives greater evidence and I'm giving you, you know, you know Kashmir it has happened in several cases. It's happened in the Makkah Masjid Blast, it's happened in Ajmer Sharif, it's happened in Samjhata Express and it's happened even in Malegaon, you know, to just to name a few. So if you don't use torture, how come innocents are confessing to several cri uh, uh, crimes and gladly going to jail? Even if we are using torture in an occasional case, it's very simple torture. I think it's the fear of torture more than the torture itself. And, you know, what we are hearing of, of what happened, you know, in, in Guantanamo Bay and waterboarding and people um, not being allowed to sleep with blaring music and, and that, that kind of thing, we don't do that kind of thing. It's not necessary. And, and since you mentioned Kashmir, let me tell you another thing. It, it, you know, that in Kashmir, what is it? It's the ISI versus the IB. And ask any Kashmiri and he will tell you that, you know, uh, bullying is counterproductive. It's not that the IB gets full marks there, but they say that you guys at least, you know, uh, are not as bad as those guys across. So we have, one of the reasons I think we moved forward in Kashmir is, as the Americans call it, we've been on the better side of history. So... Force, bullying, it, it, it beyond the point, it's counterproductive. I'm glad you make that point. Uh, 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 Vivek, you've been making a case, I can see, for parliamentary oversight of intelligence agencies in India. You're saying that you know, the time has come, you know, our democracy is probably matured, or have I misunderstood you? No, I, I've uh, come to the conclusion that some kind of oversight is required. I'm still not certain in my mind of what would be the precise nature of that. Well, oversight. there was a bill that uh, a Congress Minister Manish Tiwari presented as a private member's bill called the uh, Draft Intelligence Services Powers and Regulation Bill of 2011. It was introduced as a private member's bill and news reports said Prime Minister Manmohan Singh himself intervened and told the minister to withdraw it. Now, but isn't it time uh, that the government itself brought such a bill? Look, uh, I have great respect for Parliament. I think it is our supreme institution. But the moment anybody says this, I know a qualification is coming. No, so no. What is it? The qualification is that is our politics mature enough to handle oversight? That is, it's not parliament as an institution. I think our parliamentarians are patriotic. I think our parliamentarians are uh, pursue national interest always and every time. But the politics of India, as of today, will it permit oversight? That is the question in my mind, and to that I must confess I have not been able to find a definitive answer. Therefore, I cannot tell you... So what are the uh, reasons for your apprehension that Indian polity would not be able to handle Indian oversight? Indian politics, different from polity. The polity the requires The distinction you are oversight. making is between parliament and politics as it exists outside parliament. As it exists, which impacts on parliament too. So it's, it's terribly fractious at the moment. And, and but these reports don't have to be made public. Listen, uh, one is uh, prudent enough to know that uh, there is very little in India which doesn't become public. So therefore, my caution, because these are... So you're look, actually no, making no, a case no, for no, not no, bringing not, in please, oversight. Please, no, 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 please. Uh, let me uh, spell it out in one sentence. A, I think... League, league interrogation has to be effective and legal. And Mr. Dullat has clarified that fully. Uh, two, I think, as I've told you, there has to be a little skepticism at the product to see. Right. Which doesn't mean that there has, doesn't have to be skepticism at yeah. the product of MEA. But that has to be there. But, but three, Oversight, yes, but what will be the nature of the yeah. oversight? I think on that we need far if greater may, debate yeah, I mean, and I, clarity. I, I'm coming to you. The nature of oversight doesn't have to be only about torture and detention. Can we use a no, funds, if I may come uh, in at this uh, point, uh, productivity? See, uh, uh, to correct you also on a point that uh, Mr. Manish Tewari's bill was tabled in as a private bill yes, and it was. is in public domain. Similarly, the lapse bill, as a lapse bill. No, no, well, no. that may be, but there work is being done on it even in the cabinet secretariat <coughs> as... Uh, Mr. Manish Tiwari himself uh, indicated. And uh, we have also done another uh, task force report for the IDSA, which is in public domain. And accountability has to be a step-by-step -step process. First, there should be a legal status of, of the agencies. Yep. Then there should be three types of accountability. Executive, uh, 
political and financial. Well, I, so, I, I, hope, I hope we get that. But let me, the last mm -hmm. question to you. You know, accountability and you know, oversight is, you know, let's leave that aside. Uh, now, India does not seem to be bothered, you know, to, as, as he pointed out, to have a legal framework within which our intelligence uh, agencies operate. But leave that also aside. We don't seem to be bothered about torture at all. Although India is a signatory to the UN Convention Against Torture of 1975, we tried to bring in a bill, Prevention of Torture Bill of 2010, and allowed it to lapse. Why is that? But uh, why do you say we are not bothered about torture? I, we would, I, I, we would no, ratify no. the UN Convention if you were bothered. We allow a bill that is brought in no, by no, the no, government, no. we allow it to lapse, and, uh, uh, and nothing happens, As which I means you have not ratified. You have signed but not ratified the UN Convention on Torture. No, as I said, I don't think really just now there's a need for it. I don't think just now there is a, a need for that kind of, uh, like uh, Ambassador Kaju said. I agree with him entirely. I think, and also Rana has made the right point, that step by step, time, it will come. Okay. But as an intelligence man, yeah, yeah, I would resist it for the present. Yeah. No, no, I, I think we need to sign that convention. But that, no, please, convention no, no, is already no, signed, not ratified. No, no, sorry, ratify that convention. I was involved in part of that process at one yeah. stage. But that is for normal crime. You see, Let's distinguish between normal crime, the normal police activities, and terror. So one, terror one, one, one morality for normal hmm. crime, another one for uh, uh, torture. Uh, in terrorism. some cases, I can say emphatically, yes, the terrorist, does he deserve the same kind of humane treatment? I'm not suggesting that uh, the American practices are right, but torture is wrong. But yes, sustained interrogation, hmm using the techniques which our intelligence that agencies prisoners, is prisoners required. prisoners should not have rights and they should be... No, look, let's not be... Or some prisoners should look, not have rights. It's no, very no, but, but, no, no, but it's by the same token, the, the killing of innocents by terrorists who blow up people, these, these oh, people so also we are, don't we are, have we are rights. So we back to human rights guaranteed by yes, the state as well as by... No, no, anyway, so, have, so you get back, you uh, get so back into it's, all it's, kinds of arguments, but let's not get into that. That's another controversy. Let's not get into that. Okay, so we've run out of time. I'd like to thank all of you. Mr. Rana Banerjee, Ambassador Vivek Karju, Mr. A.S. Dulat for coming here, participating in this lively discussion. Thank you very much indeed. That's all we have for you today. We'll be back again next week, of course. Till then, goodbye. And thank you for watching.